three. Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big P here. You already know that, don't you? Because that's why you've tuned in. I've got a special free treat for you today. Rico's jetted in from Finland to the UK. He's back in rainy, drizzy, snowy and freezing London. So, how are you doing, Rico? Are you all right, mate? I'm all right, mate. Uh, it's not even snow in London. It's just rainy, it? drizzy. No, no snow. I saw somebody uh, send me a photo from Birmingham way yesterday and it was uh, snowy there, but yeah, no snow there. here. Yeah. Uh, I've jetted into tier four. That's what I've done. I've jetted in from freedom to tier four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did your New Year's go, Terry? Uh, sorry, Rico in Finland. Were it all right? Yeah, good. You don't have that many restrictions there, so people wear masks, but there's no really, there's not nothing shut, and you know things close a bit earlier. But yeah, it's it's good. It's nice to be somewhere which isn't as you know, restrictions as the UK, but, yeah. you know, that's why you imagine all the boxers are in Dubai at the moment and then they land back and the next day they training, although they're meant to be isolating for 10 days. Is it cold out there, Finland? Uh, yeah, it was minus three or four, but we had quite a bit of snow, so it was good. Is it that country where people chuck the sends off buildings because there's no daylight? <laughs> I think, yeah, well, yeah, suicide rates are high in Finland, but I don't think it's only because of that. People like their alcohol, and um, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, suicide rates are quite high in Finland, but I don't think it, when it's dark, like 2 3 p.m., it gets really, really dark. So it, does it, it does feel like it's dark. Yeah, it does feel like it's dark all day at times. Is it like that in Sweden and that as well? Yeah, the more north you go, the more quicker it gets dark. And I think Sweden and Finland don't sort of on parallel with each other. So it means that I live sort of southwest Finland. So it's not as dark as if you go up at Lapland. In Lapland, it's really dark. But then when you have a lot of snow on the ground, it doesn't get as dark. Lapland, that's where Father Christmas lives, isn't it? Yeah, that's Finland. Is that a proper Finland. place? Yeah, northern Finland. Oh, my kids were going on about that. I says there's no such place. Is there, oh, yeah. What's that? I thought, I thought he lived that with Greenland. What's Greenland then? Greenland, sort of like that's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, we need to get you. Place. We need to get you a geography map, Paul Key. I need to get me somewhere. Now. When, when you're doing when you're doing these videos, you need one of these maps behind you. Yeah, we well, all good at geography at school, Rico. That's all right because I used to play a lot of football managers, so I used to know uh, where the different cities were based on the clubs. That's the way to learn, isn't it? <laughs> Who did Yari Lippmann and play for? Uh, he played for Ajax first, then he went to Barcelona, then he went to Liverpool, then he went to German club and Swedish club, and then he went to Fulham in the end. He's from your area, isn't he? Yeah. I remember him being shortlisted for Ballon d'Or one year. He, he was well yeah. put on it. Yeah, he was, uh, that was the year when Ajax won the uh, Champions League, and he was basically a star man. But um, that's when Patrick Kluivert made his debut in the Champions League final. Go on, Rico, with football starts. <laughs> right then uh, moving on there were a little bit of a show on last night in Dallas in Texas in America uh, there were five fights on and four of them were garbage the one I want to talk about is Cool Hand Luke just from down the road down here in Hull and Ryan Garcia what did you think of it Rico? I've been saying all week on Twitter that I think British fans, many of them, and people within boxing in Britain got way too excited about Campbell because they kept on saying that, you know, he's got more pedigree. Um, Garcia has never faced anybody like him before, which is true, right? Garcia's fairly inexperienced compared to him. But you don't match make your biggest star against someone like Campbell if you think there's a good risk of them losing. So I thought it was a good fight. I thought it was really entertaining. Um, I thought Garcia showed a lot of grit, you know, getting up from that knockdown. I don't think it was a heavy knockdown. It was a bit of balance, got counted. Um, but I thought it was, I gave Campbell two rounds in that fight, but Garcia was easily in control and ahead on points. And I just thought that Campbell, I don't really know what he was doing. Uh, in terms of tactics, 
Like he was just waiting to counter punch. He was just standing there. He wasn't applying any pressure. Um, yeah, I just thought the game plan was off. I thought people got overexcited about Campbell's amateur pedigree and the fact that he had lost closely to Luares and went the distance from Lovachenko. But the younger fresher man won and also the aggressor. And I think they played into Garcia's hands. I, I thought Garcia did all right, but I thought there were some fundamental mistakes he made. Um, he had his chin up in the air when he was throwing punches. He was quite flat-footed. Um, he didn't throw enough combination punches. don't think he used the ring that well. He was just coming forward. So if Garcia is going to step up, he needs to show me a bit more. But I thought it was a good performance and I thought it was a really good piece of matchmaking from Golden Boy. Uh, yeah, I did. I thought it was a good fight, but... What I want to know is why Luke Campbell didn't jump on him. He had plenty of time left when he dropped him, didn't he? he, he like he was shocked, wasn't it? And he, he, I don't know what. I don't know. It, well, they kept on saying in the commentary, which was shocking, that Luke Campbell's best weapon is his jab. And the only thing he was doing is not even trying to jab. He was doing that kind of matador thing that Rigondo does, where you sort of move your lead hand above and trying to get somebody to throw a punch so you can counter them. But, I mean, Luke Campbell was never going to win on points with that tactic, but then he was never going to win by counter-punching either. Yeah. Do you feel, do you feel that Luke Campbell's style's a, a bit still amateur issues? Amateur. Yeah. Amateur. Yeah, I was, saying that. I was saying that to a mate yesterday, that Luke Campbell, if you watch him, you're looking at a high-class amateur um, that's not used to stopping people or stepping up the gas. Mm. I don't really know why he, because, you know, he's usually the bigger guy. Now they were about the same, but his probably frame is bigger than Garcia's, but he didn't capitalise on the inexperience of Garcia. He didn't want to push him backwards. Um, he didn't really take any risks in that fight. It was like they wanted to, for it to go on points and hoping that Campbell would win. Hmm. He did just enough to lose. I think that's always been my sort of expression of Luke Campbell, whether it be against Lomachenko, Linares or Garcia last night. He does just enough to lose. Um, he doesn't have a significant win beyond Euro level. He's got a Commonwealth title at home, Rico, Luke Campbell, just like Tommy Coyle, and that's it. He's no British or European title. Well, yeah, I mean, look, he's... He beat Mendy in a rematch, but and after that they just chucked him to Lions Den against uh, Linares away from home. Um, I think, yeah, I think um, if you look at someone like Crawler, Crawler's had a better career and done a lot better. Crawler's got a better body of work. Yeah, he does. Now you know I like to give Eduardo some stick. Good morning, Eddie. But to be fair, and I've heard this from. Orsa's mouth that uh, Eddie Earn wanted to make that Mendy rematch. They didn't want it. Team Campbell didn't want it. The people behind the scenes and they waited three years before he fought Mendy again and I think that period, that three year period is what killed him off. I mean he is 33-34 this year Um so, yeah, but, I mean, he didn't turn... When he turned over, he wasn't the youngest of fighters. So they should have just, you know, motored him through. He wasted a, a year, didn't he, messing about with doing TV shows and that? Yeah. Because Eddie Hearn told him, build your profile up and all that, blah de blah Well, there were a year wasted there, and then he was fighting stiffs, one until he got beat by Mendy. And then he wasted three years... But Mendy rematch. But what I want, what I want, what I want to point out is, Luke Campbell wasted all that time. Joe Joyce is two years older than him, and he's in a better position because he didn't mess about with them dummy fights, did he? He got straight yeah. down to business, Joe Joyce, didn't he? And let me tell you this: that's the way to do it, like Lomachenko. Because when you're Olympic gold medal standard, I mean, we know. Joyce got a silver, but a case could be made for gold, couldn't it? When you're that level, why do you need to be fighting 20 stiffs? Yeah, you don't build... I think it's just the British way of building fighters. I think it's 
all comes down to ticket sales, doesn't it? Because somebody's an Olympian and won the gold medal, they just want to milk it as much as they can. Uh, there's no real urgency of getting these guys meaningful opponents. Do you feel that once Eddie Earn realised that Luke Campbell weren't the big draw that he thought he were going to be, you know, when they had the fight, you know? Yeah. He gave him a headline, didn't he? Do you think once he realised that, do you think that's that's when he backed off from him? He, you know, not backed off, that's a bit harsh. Do you think that's where they didn't really get behind him? But I, I've never really thought that Matchroom have got behind Luke Campbell, me. I think they've, they've just got behind Joshua and... I think that's about, about it. And a few yeah, I, I think, to be fair, I think, you know, he had that Tommy Coyle fight, right? Then he fought against Mendy. Uh, this was like 2005. Sorry, 2015. He fought against Mendy and he lost. And after that, they just built him up to with some easy victories, uh, domestic fights. They got him that Linares shot a few years later. He lost that. And then I think they realised that he will be a good opponent in a world level fight, um, sort of like a world against a world class opponent, whether that be Lomachenko. I think you're right, probably that pay per view against Lomachenko, which Eddie always mentions is the worst selling pay per view in Matchroom's history. I think that's when they realize that this guy isn't really that much of a draw. And being an Olympian doesn't mean that much if you don't have an exciting style, does it? People aren't going to back an Olympian. It's not like Olympic boxing is the most watched uh, sport in the Olympics. It's fairly niche when it comes to Olympic sports. Luke Campbell lives in a million pound house near Umber Bridge, near at sea. So he's done well for himself to say he's only got a Commonwealth title on, on mantelpiece, hasn't he? Yeah, I think, you know what, he did, he has challenged the best in the division. Um, I still, I said before the fight that we don't know what Luke Campbell's level really is. I mean, he beat Mendy, who was much older at that point. I think Mendy must have been in his mid-30s when he beat him. But is he British level? Is he Euro level? Is he fringe world level? Like, that's a bit unclear because his victories don't correlate with that. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. Uh, what did you think to Shane McGuigan doing selfies with Canelo uh, after fighting ring? What do you think to that? Just... Uh, you know what, he's... Um... Come on, Rocky. Come on, give me this like Rocky. Actually. Yeah. yeah, I think oh. to that question, yeah, Canelo's a big star boxer. I'm sure Shane's a fan as well uh, of boxing, so I don't really have necessarily a problem with that. And I know they did some in the changing room afterwards, but it's all in good spirits. I, I just question Shane McGuigan's record as a trainer. Well, uh, he oh, inherited, Let's have inher a Go on, he's yeah. right. Yeah, so he inherited Frampton. He inherited Groves. He inherited uh, Hay. He inherited Chris Billum Smith. He inherited Campbell. He's inherited Fowler. Josh Pitchard might be his kid from the start. So I don't think there's many guys that he's actually trained from scratch and also Frampton to start, right? But, but yeah, he trained him well and, you know, Frampton was his yeah, from, from debut, debut, Rico. I think Frampton might have had another trainer. Yeah, um, he was with some old guy, wasn't he, from the beginning? Yeah, so I think once like he signed... Like he's from, isn't he? Yeah, once he like signed... Him, what, like Frampton. Yeah, once he signed with uh, Barry McGuigan, I think Shane became his trainer. I know they knew each other from the amateurs, um, before, um, but yeah, I think Frampton was a star, and yeah, he can take a lot of credit for what he's did with Frampton. But with these other guys, I'm not so sure about how much credit can he take for that. Mm. I see where you're coming from, Rico. Okay, what, like, okay, as a trader, Frampton is done well with from a relatively early stage of his career, but who else do you think he's improved? I don't know. I bought into the Shane McGuigan hype because he got Groves over the line and against Trudinov. Yeah, who's who's Shane McGuigan's best win as a trainer? Is he still inexperienced? And another thing I wanted to scramped it against Santa Cruz won. That's his best win. But in the second fight, they didn't adapt. Yeah, I want to point. Out, I know 
Oh, I thought it were in bad taste doing pictures with Canelo afterwards. I know, yeah, he's a big superstar and he's the biggest name in boxing, bigger than anybody, Joshua, Eddie, and anybody, but even Fury is bigger than him, Tyson Fury. Is it bigger than John Fury, though? That's the question. Not as big as John Fury. That's why John Fury is a BT Sport pundit. He never won a belt as a fighter, but he's a sp- BT Sport pundit. Dave Allen's a Sky pundit now. He never won a belt either. I've not won a belt. Have I got a chance? <laughs> you, you do. Uh, porky, on, porky on Sky. Yeah. Bleeping. <laughs> bleeping. Bleeping. Oh, bleeping, yeah. Bleep, bleep, bleep. <laughs> No, They'll but get you a few black sheep, and uh, yeah. then they let you set you off. If the point I want to make is, could you see Jamie Moore asking for a selfie with Canelo after Canelo iced Rocky Fielding? No, no. no. I mean, I don't think Joe Gallagher saw one after the Liam um, fight, did he? No, and after Joe Gallagher never asked for a selfie with Canelo after Callum Smith went 12 rounds and he were injured one for nine. Yeah, and it's different. It's different when you go in the changing rooms um, after the fight, but, you know, in the ring, it's it, it screams of the mentality that we're just happy to be here, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. He wanted to milk the moment. Yeah. And I, would, I was disappointed with Shane McGuinger for that. I don't think Shane, just for the record, I don't think Shane's a bad trainer, but he goes into that go to Adam Booth category where everybody needs to go to Shane McGuigan to improve. And but I, I haven't seen many fighters improve again, you know, improve um, under him when they've oh, leave him, him don't they? Well, they do, yeah. I, uh, what was the other one? Le, Liam, the Scottish kid. Oh, the yeah, champion. Josh Taylor, but that was Josh more Taylor. to do with. But that was more to do with Barry McGuigan. Actually, Josh Taylor is somebody that Shane did um, train, so we need to give credit for that. Did he have they were... I think as a pro he did, yeah. Still left him. I don't want to go in on Shane and make it like a, you know, you know, every, uh, you know, like a Dave Caldwell sermon. No, I mean, look, Shane's a good trainer, but I don't think he's the silver bullet um, solve the problems. And no, we don't, we don't, we don't want to do a Dave Caldwell doing an aftermath every weekend after big fights and just no and IFL boxing social Dave Caldwell's opinion on another Brit losing and all this rubbish. Oh, he's in Daily Mail that. as well these days. Hey. He's a Daily Mail as well, right? So you call him about boxing. Well, Eddie Earn give him a slot at Daily Mail to get him a few quid, didn't he? You know, he's Eddie's yeah. man, isn't he, Caldwell? Evening, yeah. Steve, how are you doing? No, uh, this is how I look at it, right? Where does Luke Campbell go from here? Who does he fight? Does he fight Tennyson? Yeah, I think Tennyson. Like Bird. Well, if you think about it. You know, now we know that he's sort of a gatekeeper level. If Tennyson can stop him, then Tennyson can move to the next level. Uh, I think that's sort of the thing. But does Luke Campbell still want to fight? What about Luke Campbell and Aras too? I could see Eddie recycling that, could you, as intense beef? You know, it'd be that, it'd be killed up corned beef, wouldn't it, that? We want to I mean, see Linares that. Is, Linares is 35 now. He's got a new girlfriend in Japan and he seems to be loving the life. So, do you think Eddie Earn would be bothered about that? He'd put it on in Japan under on undercard of Joshua versus that big China man who we fought. Possibly. In. They could put it on as intense raw sushi, something like that, mm. couldn't they? Yeah, I mean, they could do that. <laughs> Linares, yeah, Linares, it depends if Linares wants to fight, but I think Linares will win another world title shot. They might dig Linares up or Ricky Burns for, for him. Do I have, a, the only, have a battle of Britain, Scotland versus England? The only thing with Linares is he doesn't speak English. I met him and uh, Ismail Salas once, um, and yeah, Linares doesn't speak much English. Salas speaks a bit more, but yeah, he, he doesn't speak a word of English pretty much. Nice so, guy, though. Yeah, who's Quite the, big. Who's the most successful boxer then from Hull? Um, Coyle, Luke Campbell or Curtis Woodhouse? You'd have to say probably Luke Campbell if you think about Olympic gold. Yeah, but who's the most successful as a pro? 
I think you probably have to say Luke Campbell. Just because Why would you after. Curtis Woodhouse won a British title? Don't, don't British titles mean anything, Rico, no more? No, I mean, of course they do, but look, you have to look at what's the highest level somebody's force at. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. Point and also, point. like, how much money, you know, winning a... Was it Curtis Woodhouse against... Um, who did he beat against? Was he against Aaron Hamilton? Hamilton. Ben Sapiron's man. Spencer Feerman's man, it was like an orgasm for me, like best orgasm I've ever had. <laughs> but uh, what I will say is, hey, listen, Curtis Woodhouse has been successful. It's not his fault. Well, it, sorry, it is his fault that he's done six million in bookies, isn't it? You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> but other than that, I, as regards belts, Curtis Woodhouse has got a British title. So when you get a British title, you go down in history, don't you? Yeah, but when you get an Olympic gold, you go down in history. Yeah, you do, but as a pro we're talking, aren't we? You'd expect more from Luke Campbell and Eddie Earn, wouldn't you? I mean, he won a gold in 2012. We're 2021 now, and he's not won a British or a European or a world. So what well, you, you do, you, you go on a lot about the British title, but, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean the board doesn't make it exactly easy and the mandatories aren't made easily. It's not like a British title can be made as easily. Luke Campbell could have picked a British title up in the first 12 months of his career instead of going on a, a dancing programme, trying to feather his nest. No, I he yeah, I agree with that. Rap. I mean, the fight against Tommy Cole should have been for the British title. He should have been, he should have been learning his craft. Now, Crawler's got a British title, hasn't he? Yeah. So... And but Crawler came up a different way. Remember, when you're yeah. an Olympian, it's a race against time to try and maximise the income for the promoter and the fighter. It's not necessarily about getting all the titles. It's about maximising your income and it's about building a star. And sometimes these WBC trinkets look better. Uh, you world-ranked British titles. One of the reasons why these British titles have lost their value is because you have so many WBC, WBA trinkets and others, they means that you can get quicker up the rankings than a British title. You know, in Frotcher's day, I know you love to talk about Froch. In Frotcher's day, you didn't have a million trinkets. You couldn't go for a regular. You couldn't go for an intercontinental. You couldn't go for this or this or this. Froch were offered them, but he knocked it back. He said, I want to go traditional route. Clinton Woods went from area level to British because there were no English belt in them days. So yeah. Clinton, uh, Clinton's got the clean sweep from area belt. And I think Clinton thought he'd do well to get a British. But once you go through levels, you, you say, right, let's go to the next level. And there were a couple of uh, defeats along the way. And the, it, to, be on, to be fair to Dennis, they regrouped him and brought him back well. They were a good team. But they learned his craft. Luke Campbell's, could turn, could won a gold medal, then done note for a year, got beat a couple of years later, and then he's then he's is is swerved rematch for three year, and I think that was the beginning of the end for him. We realised that when he got beat, you know, that he wasn't a big ticket seller, and he'd have to, he'd have to go on road to learn. I need to go out training in Miami with Ismael Salas. Yeah, probably. And, and what happened to that relationship? I mean, look at Salas. I mean, Salas is a guy that he's trained here, there. Uh, he's not the kind of guy that you get as a trainer that's going to do a full camp with you, unless it's David Hay. I mean, he's, he's standing on those platform shoes, is Mark Salas. So, who would have trained that's five foot ten? I mean, five foot five? Yeah, no. But yeah, I think with Luke Campbell, essentially, the problem is that he was too stuck in the amateur style and there was just nothing that you could do with that. So you had to try and navigate him. I don't think he was ever designed to be a very good pro. That's just the reality. Yeah. Yeah, he's too upright, isn't it? Um, I, I mean, they could still get a world title with him, couldn't they? But they'd have to match him carefully and he'd have to float one, wouldn't he? I mean, he's 33 years old. Once you lose two world title fights at that age is quite hard to come back. I mean, what's he going to learn? And he's just going to physically decline. So I don't think he would have been stopped with that body shot three years ago. 
Was that a world title last night? Because some, there's some debate about that, Rico, isn't there? Uh, I think it's a, it was an interim title. So it's not a real world title. Devin Haney has the email title and then Garcia now has the interim title. Well, that's like going to buy a Sierra Cosworth and not being able to afford insurance and and, and going and buying a Sierra gear and pulling gear badge off and sticking some cosy wheels on it. Like where I used on Porky the Motor Trader, Porky's <laughs> coming out here. <laughs> Most of the people listening are going to be like, why are you talking about? I'm not sure. Just the Porky. There's English and there's Porklish. <laughs> uh, that's what I did back in the day uh, years ago. I used to have a it was a J Reg 92 metallic grey Sierra two litre injection gear. And I wanted a Cosworth really, but there was just mega insurance, wasn't there? So I just debadged it, told everybody it was a Cosy. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you sold it to the I bet you sold it uh, second hand to somebody as well. Uh, yeah, I did actually. Yeah, <laughs> I saw it as a cosy lookalike. <laughs> uh, moving on, then, uh, let's have a look. Um, Eddie, um, what will he say now about this? Somebody asked me yesterday, and I said, and I quote, he will come out and say, We're a great fight, great evening. And, and Luke Campbell's stock's risen, we're gonna hear all this, aren't we, this week. But will Dave Caldwell, when he does the Dave Caldwell sermon, that's what people in industry are calling it, right. the Dave Caldwell Sunday morning sermon, Andy McCart, uh, Rob Tebber, they're straight on him, aren't they? Omar IFL, all the, all the gimps from Gimpville Island or Bean Mason Island. Dave Caldwell's opinion, because Dave Caldwell's opinion matters. Now, somebody sent me a screenshot last night of something that uh, he'd actually put out. And it had me in stitches, actually. I had me in proper stitches. Here we are. Listen to this. This is a good one. Evening, Dave. Uh, somebody called Danny, at Danny, MO2571. Can't wait for, at Dave Caldwell, 40-minute breakdown of another Brit quitting on IFL tomorrow. <laughs> Caldwell jumped in within one minute, within one minute, and replied, It's gone 12.30 a.m. and you're thinking about me. Get a girlfriend, mate. P.S. I get asked for interviews and you don't have to click on them. Thumbs up. So Dave Caldwell, hashtag raging. What do you think to that? <laughs> <laughs> Bell you of the week, that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Dave Cornwell, Belly, and everybody else were saying how Lou Campbell's going to shock the world. And this is why I don't get about British uh, boxers and people in the boxing industry. None of them can be honest. They always have to back the breath because they want to say the right thing. But why weren't people pointing out the same frailties as I was pointing out? Campbell hadn't fought for 16 months. He'd, he was coming off a loss. He's 33 years old. Garcia stopped his last two opponents. So the guy, the guy he lost stopped, I think went 12 rounds of Tank Davis and then got stopped. So he's not a smaller guy, but it's still, you know, it was still a decent enough fight and yardstick. And also nobody questioned the idea of why do you think Golden Boy were happy to accept Luke Campbell and put him in there? But they also well, he blind, wrote side, didn't they? But they also blind and focused on the fact that. If a Brett's fighting and they've lost at a higher level, that they suddenly too much for a younger guy. If the shoe was on the other foot and Garcia was British, everybody would be saying that, um, you know, Garcia's favourite for these and these reasons. It's all so biased, it's crazy. Yeah, I suppose, yeah, but it's going to be interesting to see how, how, the, how they come out and deal with this now because. Like I've just said, we have the Dave Caldwell sermon every Sunday on mm -hmm. IFL and Boxing Social. And he's saying it's not his fault he gets asked for interviews, which he keeps repeating all the time. But let me tell you this, and this is a true story. Michelle Joy Phelps walked straight up to Peter Fury in Bubble a few weeks and said, Hey, Peter, can I have an interview? Peter just went, no, and turned away. You get asked for an interview, you don't have to do them. I'm not going to go into reasons why he said no, but Peter Fury just went, no. All Dave Caldwell's got to say is, no, I'm too busy. I ain't got time. 
You know, yeah, when you're also, doing interviews from home, I'm not on about when you're in the bubble. They expect you to do them in the bubble, but Peter just said no. And he's in the bubble and they have media commitments, don't they? So he's not an arse licker. But you get Dave Caldwell all sitting doing them in his own at night and they got better things to do when you've been at gym all day. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. What did he make of... Um, what did he make of the commentary? Uh, well, Gareth A. Davis, I can see why his missus left him now. Did you see the state of him? He's going <laughs> a midlife crisis. <laughs> with Vin Diesel chain on Polo Neck. What's all that? Why didn't he just get Del Boy's chain and with D on it for Del Boy? I was expecting him to try and kung fu kick uh, Ricky Hatton. Remember those oh. IFL videos where he was trying to do some sort of spinning kicks? <laughs> a grown man. I ain't got no time for Ricky Atten. When Dennis had that evening with Ricky Atten at his football club, I didn't go. I said, I'm not going. He's not my cup of tea. But they're keeping Ricky Atten sweet at the zone, aren't they? Because they've signed Campbell Atten. You see, this is how I... Well, look. Sky has signed him, but I think I didn't think it really worth necessarily having this dual commentary where you have the UK perspective. You know, you don't need that, do you? It didn't add anything that we have to... People Ricky Atten looked pissed up to me, mate. But this is how I look at it, right? Sky get behind pantomime marks. For example, have Sky ever got behind Callum Smith? Really? No, no. Right. Do they get behind Connor Ben? Yes. Who's got the better pedigree? Well, we don't need to answer that question. Callum Smith by a country mile, and it fair enough. He's been beat by Canelo, but. We all have a bad day at office, but he jumped through every hoop and he and completed everything. Tested himself against the best, took it, and the... he's a and he's a former world champion. So and yeah. the best in magazine, so. yeah. Well, he won all belts at every level. He's gone through the levels like I like to see. You know, people keep going on about it. All them gimps from Gimpville Island, but. You've just seen what happens when you don't go through the levels. Anthony Yard didn't go through the levels, found wanted. Luke Campbell's got a Commonwealth. He's failed at every other level, found wanting. Learn your craft. We need to get rid of all this trinket crap and go back to building the British Boxing Board to put control up to a force that it used to be. Do you trust uh, your friends at the British Boxing Board of Control to do that? Well, I don't know. I mean, don't they want the British British to be best? I mean, there used to be a time where we used to make the best cars, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Rolls-Royce, Bentley, Austin Mini Metro. <laughs> <laughs> we used to make the best of everything, didn't we? We had the biggest navy. We built the biggest houses. What 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 have we got now? What what what, what have we got? Connor Ben driving around. Driving around in some foreign car, hey, and not not won a British title, but yet he's world ranked. Is that what is that what we're about now? Are we going to see it same with Campbell Hatton? Oh, he's a Hatton. We might get all the following because of his dad. Well, his son, his sorry, his brother, Matthew Hatton didn't have a big following. Do you no. know what I mean? He didn't do numbers. Look, you know what? Credit to Oscar, he's a bit of a mess, but he does find talent. So, you know, they signed, obviously, Canelo at an early age. They've got Ryan Garcia. They've got that Virgil Ortiz that's destroying everybody at 147. Uh, they've got a few other good kids. So they found their niche, uh, sort of like Mexican-American fighters, Mexican fighters, and they actually find in talent. And these guys are guys that aren't necessarily the biggest of amateur stars, I think Ryan Garcia was a very good amateur. He, he's won a lot of accolades. He's got over 200 amateur fights. But Matchroom signs fighters based on what stories they can build around them. And that's, that's the opposite to Frank Warren in some regards. I mean, at least with Frank, the shows might not be great, but at least with Frank, he's signing kids that aren't the most, you know, are under the radar. They aren't necessarily the guys that... Are Olympians, and you're not going to get the best fighters by just signing Olympians. You can find find ABA winners, whether that's guys like Yard, who's an ABA winner, or you know, done really well in the amateurs, but a bit under radar. So you need to give Frank credit for that. Do you feel, Rico, that Luke Campbell will go down as a worse addition of an Olympic gold medalist than Audley Harrison? No, 
I mean, or did he didn't even get to that level, did he? Well, Audley Harris, I mean, he, he won a European title. Luke Campbell hasn't got, got a European. Yeah, but, you know, Audley, the backing that Audley had, he was expected to be the next big thing. I think with Campbell, the backing wasn't really ever there. And even if you look at the class of uh, 2012, Olympic gold medalist, you have Zhu Shiming, who was a guy that, uh, the Chinese guy, I think he might have won a world title, that Robson Ramirez guy, I think he lost recently or quite early in his career. Uh, Murata, Japanese middleweight, he's won a title. Then there's a few other, you've got Joshua Nusik, but you look through the Olympics, it's not like every amateur becomes, every Olympic amateur becomes a good pro because Team GB don't necessarily pick the best guys to go to the Olympics. It's a bit of a popularity contest. You've got guys like Fred Evans have won silver fall to away. I mean, whatever happened to him, he lost to... He was supposed to be the next big thing since sliced bread, wasn't he? Yeah, he lost to someone, didn't he, quite early on, and then he sort of retired. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that Luke Campbell, you know, winning a gold medal 2012 and now 2021, he had four defeats and 20 wins, so that's 24 fights. Do you feel that he's not been active? I think he's been active enough, but it's just the level of opposition. So it, it's this thing in the UK where you lose a fight. I mean, okay, he lost to Lomachenko and he got this opportunity against Garcia. But usually if you lose a fight, like you lose to Mendy or somewhere, someone, then you fight against two easy opponents and then you have sort of a middling test in Dali's Perez. It just means that you're wasting a year of your career or two years of your career fight against guys that you should be beating just to build up your confidence. All right, then, Rico, I'll ask you this. Who is Luke Campbell's best four wins? Tommy Cole. Is that uh, his best win, though? No. I think Dali's Perez, Mendy. I know you're going to say Derry Matthews, but that's about it. Derry Matthews and Tommy Coyle, Mendy and who? Oh. Perez. Perez. Is that his body of work? That is his body of work. So if you marry his body of work up with Shane McGuigan's, do you think that we, we all really got caught up in the hype of it all before yesterday because people were actually tipping Campbell to win? But once you scratch the surface, he's got a very young trainer who's, who, who's going to be probably a great trainer, but a very young trainer. And we've got Luke Campbell with really, he's like, He's like turning up at a Formula One race in just like a, I don't know, a Ford Mondeo, isn't he? A saloon car racing car in a Formula One. Yeah, I, th I think some people got caught up with the hype. Uh, I certainly didn't, and I bet money on Garcia to stop Campbell. So I made a few bucks doing that. But I think people, it wasn't necessarily that people thought that Campbell's the next best thing since sliced bread. Sliced bread. I think it's more that people thought that Garcia is a social media star and he's not a real boxer. He's a YouTuber. Yeah, the guy has 8 million followers on Instagram and, you know, young women like him for his good looks. But at the end of the day, you know, he's got over 200 amateur fights. He was too young to fight in the Olympic qualifiers in the US when he was 18. He yeah. been dedicated to boxing his whole life. So Campbell was out of the ring for 16 months. Campbell hadn't had a significant win at top level. He's coming off a loss. So I think on paper, if you just look at both of these guys' careers, one is ascending and one is descending, it's quite evident that Campbell wasn't, shouldn't be even close to the favourite. It was just a matched fight where it looked good on paper because if they would have caught Campbell next and maybe Campbell would have lost his next fight, whoever he was fighting against, anyone decent, so that would have been too late. Now they got him where people in Britain believe that he is... You know, he's going to win. And I saw so many people on Twitter saying that, oh, Campbell at the price of points is a great bet because who's going to go to Texas and beat the favourites on a Golden Boy show? I mean, people need to wake up. And also, what has Campbell shown that we should be thinking that he should be the favourite in this fight? Yeah, I can see where you're coming at. Yeah, he hasn't really shown us anything, but like I said, his best win is Darlis Perez, and Crawler had already touched him up, hasn't he? Yeah. That's it. 
And I also, one point I want to say is about the commentary, which was shocking because it was so biased. They made me oh my God. miss. It made me miss Matthew Macklin, Johnny Company, Man Nelson. It was it was awful. The only they said twice in the first two rounds that um, um, Garcia likes fight against Southpaws because his shots work against Southpaws, and they kept on comparing him to Oscar De La Hoya. They kept on saying he's a pretty boy, but he can fight. It's the same old lines, and it was just. Anything that Campbell did, which was good, they didn't see, and anything that Garcia did. Yeah. Now I know how it feels to be a foreign fan watching a fighter from their home country against the Sky, you know, against the Sky fighter. It was, it was terrible. They're there to narrate, 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 narrate. Awful. They're there to narrate, narrate the, the story, aren't they? Gareth A. Davis and Hatton and all the other guy who were doing the... the well, you had Chris... Chris, you had Chris Mannix, uh, you had Sergio Mora, who's, I mean, Chris Mannix and Sergio Mora are terrible. Yeah, Do you know, but this is how I look at it, right? Can Gareth A. Davis get his tongue any further up Edward's rear? No, unless he sticks his head in. Do you know what I mean? But you know why he can't get his head in there? Because Caldwell's stuck up there and <laughs> there's no room, is there? <laughs> No. You've got Caldwell up there going, Tony, Tony, move over there. You're getting greedy, Tony, Tony, no. <laughs> so you've got, and you've got uh, Belly up there. Yeah, right, yeah, nah. You've got them two up there. And Gareth A. Davis as well. I mean, Eddie must be in agony. I mean, he must need to sit in an hot bath, an hot radox <laughs> bath after having them three <laughs> hanging out of the back of him. And he weren't even there, were he? No, I don't think he was. Do you know what I, I mean? Do, I do think, yeah, I think the commentary was terrible. My favourite point was when Kate Abdel told uh, Garcia's dad that he must have good sperm. <laughs> I know. Kate Abdel, who's the, she was the female on it. She used to be on Sky Sports and then she went to work for the PBC. And she said, uh, she said this comment to Garcia's ta- dad because obviously Garcia's brother was fighting that. Something like he must have quite good sperm or something like that, which I thought was quite funny. But she is good. I think Kate Abda is pretty good uh, on boxing stuff. She's done PBC for years now. She's better than Michelle Phelps. <laughs> Michelle Phelps. Or, or Anna, Anna Woolhouse. Or Anna Woolhouse. Oh, Anna Woolhouse. Oh. You know, I watched an interview the other day, actually, with Shannon Courtney and Michelle Joy Phelps, mate, and I don't what, were they talking about mental health or, or mental, health, or? mental health and trolls and haters? That were it. No boxing got spoke about, and Adidas uh, global ambassador contracts for Shannon Courtney. But if a four week old video, I was just catching up. But in Shannon Courtney, uh, in a lot of trouble or some over some racist things. Yeah, I think they dug up some tweets from the past, but again, it's not. She's not going to be in trouble, is she? I mean, she just laid low for a week or two and then it's now all forgotten. And she's the mental health ambassador along with John Fury and Tyson Fury and everybody else in boxing. And McClory said he's got mental health problems now. I mean, everybody does in boxing. I mean, come on. I'm going to want to come and have a, see a few of my episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. We like we like Glenn. Glenn's a good laugh. He's a nice guy. I've terrorised them people at Lacoste that much to send in my trainers now. <laughs> <laughs> I've found out where he lives, and I? I go around and I go, hey, mate, I thought I'd come around and see you. Oh, you're back again. We're just about to sit down. We're just having pork chops. And goes, oh, have you, I'll, I'll have a bit of dinner with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, everybody's like that when I walk in. I was, oh, pork is here. Fuck it. He's like, Who's are all them trainers over there? Go on, I'll have a few. Send me some size 10, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. No. Uh, so, basically, we've covered the Luke Campbell loss. What now for Oscar De La Hoya and Eddie Earn? Can they move forward? Because we all know that Eddie has basically stole Canelo. I mean, Canelo's walking around in a match room uh, mask, isn't he? Was he a matchroom mask? Yeah, it had a mat- it's, it's got a CA on one side and matchroom on the other. 
I've got a photo of it. Oh, oh I didn't realise. Uh, two seconds. Somebody sent me a photo of it. I mean, is it is this what it's all about now? Uh, I got this mask here. I think I took a picture of it as well. The cam, it turned the camera in the middle of the fight turns to Canelo and he's got matchroom uh, mask on. Well, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. I, it depends whether Canelo wants to stay at the zone for another fight. I mean, he's got the world is his oyster because he's a free agent. Yeah. Oh, Smido has just sent me a video of the, the, the voice of hardcore darts. Smido, darts is not the number one sport. Boxing is, mate. So crawl away with your darts. Yeah, I, I just Googled and I found the photo. Yeah, it's got that Canelo. And I think, you know what? You know why I think he's done it? It's not that he's signed with Matchroom. I think it, because otherwise we'd have a fanfare from Eddie. I think he's just done it to piss off Oscar De La Hoya. You think? Yeah. Well, Oscar were there, wasn't he? Yeah, but I think he's done it just to annoy Oscar De La Hoya to remind him that he's not Golden Boy fighter. They don't speak, do they? No, and I don't think they've spoken for a while. But even Ryan Garcia had a big falling out with Oscar, and then they signed a new contract. Uh, I don't I think, think Oscar's, Oscar's particularly close with Ryan and vice versa. This is how I look at it, Rico. Right? I think uh, Oscar De La Hoya done a good job with Canelo. He did, but, you know, the problem with Oscar was always that he didn't turn up to some fights and he wasn't at press conferences and, you know, he's got other demons that he's had to deal with and Canelo's thinking this is his career. And Oscar, when Oscar signed the deal for Canelo with Golden, sorry, with Canelo with the zone, he made a side deal where Golden Boy got to deal with um, the zone. And also, I think some of the stuff that he agreed in the contract, Canelo wasn't particularly happy with. And that's the reason why he ended up being able to... Well, they went their separate ways, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. I don't think Canelo has a big problem with the zone per se. It's more he has a problem with the control that Golden Boy had on him and the contracts that were signed and the promises that Oscar was making as his promoter to keep his own money in the pocket. Do you think that... Do you think that Eddie is looking to? I can explain it. He's looking to get his claws into Canelo uh, and stay involved because Joshua might not always be around. Do you think? Yeah, definitely. And also, the thing about Eddie is that in the US market, it's not like he's the best guy to promote a show. But what he can do, it's similar to what he's done with Triple G, is that he can put the undercard together. Uh, he can do the event management. He can do the matchmaking. And he's got access to all these YouTubers that are yeah, hanging out need, the back of him. But you don't need... you. Don't, Canelo doesn't need a promoter, does he? He can go to any network with his team and say, this is what we want. This is the fight that we want to make. And he can do that with his lawyers. He doesn't need somebody to... He brings the views. He's the guy. It's a bit like Floyd Mayweather when... Mayweather was at his prime that he didn't need a promoter per se. You know, he had Al Heyman, he had his own team, and then he'd fight on, you know, he'd fight on any types of shows. And Oscar did the same. When Oscar left uh, top rank and started Golden Boy, he still worked with Bob Aaron on certain things. Mm. Why, why let a promoter take a big cut? He probably just gives Eddie a flat fee for managing the event and putting all the stuff together. That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? Canelo's aeroplane at Dallas Airport going to back to Guadalajara, wherever it is, Guadalajara, and Oscar going back to Los Angeles. But both their jets at uh, airport, wouldn't it? That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? I reckon Canelo rides there, sort of puts out a T-shirt on a horseback all the way. Is that you see all? The you see all the photos of Canelo. He loves his horses and he's riding yeah. always topless. Yeah. He's a proper, like, gaucho, they call him in Argentina, don't they? But he's Mexican, Argentina? But, like, a proper, but he's a proper cowboy, isn't he? Oh, yeah. I thought he was Mexican. He, he is, but I'm not sure whether that's a Spanish term, but they call him gauchos, don't they? At least in Argentina, where they, um, you know, like farmers, cowboy farmers. I think he's a proper, like that, into that. He's got a big farm. and Usyk's got a horse. Do you think all great elite fighters have horses? 
probably. I think Conor Ben needs to get a horse rather than his uh, car with heated seats. Johnny Nelson's got an horse as well, so does that just put a fucking bubble in? I've just, uh, there you go, swore they're not getting paid for this one. Johnny Nelson's got an horse, so we've made a mess of that fucking phrase, haven't we? Because <laughs> <laughs> Johnny, you couldn't fight for Toffee, come see me. But, uh, all right then, Rico, well, listen, it's been a pleasure yet again. As always, my friend. And thanks for thanks to all the fans. Make sure you like and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe. Porky puts the effort in. You guys watch the videos. It takes you one second to subscribe. So underneath there is subscribe. Uh, I don't usually push that button, but yeah, people need to start people need to start subscribing and getting on the Porky Express train. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about before the start, so we're talking about all sorts of merchandise that people can wear to boxing shows when they come back to yeah. show that they aren't bean masons, that they uh are not bean masons. Fans. Maybe maybe we do like a maybe maybe we could do a badge with a little coffee bean on it. And that means that you're a bean mason if you're casual and then everybody that's a hardcore has a little porky or something on it. If there's any companies out there, I might as well say it on here because it saves uh us having to get people to email people. If there's anybody out there that's involved in merchandise, get in touch. Uh I don't want any more porky mugs because we can't shift them for toffee. <laughs> <laughs> We'll give them all away. We had some have, some have been, some have even been, I don't know if it's misplaced or nicked out at factory, but total disaster. But if there's anybody out there that does, uh, what they call it, badges, you know, that can make like a porky badge. I'm not going to say what I want on it yet because somebody might nick my idea, but I've got a couple of ideas. If anybody's out there that makes badges, or I'll send your details in. To porkycorner at mail.com and we will sort it out. And if you send was sort some designs out and then just send us an invoice and we'll sort it. It's not that hard, is it? And pens, pen badges, like pen ones. Pen not the ones pens. I've got a Dennis Hobson pen. No, no, no. A pen. A pen. Rather than, you know, like a badge, like you know, like you get at school those shitty badges when you do well at something. We well, need like little yeah. pens, like the prostate cancer type pens that. Jeff, Stelling, words and others. What about, we, why, why don't we go and get some uh, like this? A Dennis Hobson coaster. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis Hobson promotions coaster. <laughs> That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Did you steal that from uh, Ponds Forge? Did I steal it from Ponds Forge? No, I stuck it out of my old office at Dennis's. <laughs> I think, uh, I thought I'll take that. It's a bit of a gimmick, isn't it? But we should get porky coasters, shouldn't we? But now it's all good. Listen, people keep saying porky, smashing it. Look, there's no money in this as the Rico. We know that, don't we? Mm -hmm. it's just a hobby, isn't it? But if it can pay for itself instead of costing me and costing me my time as well, that's a good thing, isn't it? But it all helps. It all goes in pot, doesn't it? But uh, you've become you've become the Arsenal fan TV of boxing. Uh, I know, yeah. That what's he called? That guy who got rid of Boominator, my man. Uh Robbie, is it? Robbie, Robbie, yeah. What's you've that other Robbie. bloke who goes on there, bald head about 55, ranting and raving, screaming and shouting, Claude! The Claude. I can't stand <laughs> Arsenal, me, anyway, because I remember Michael Thomas scoring it last second, you know, in the 89. You're showing oh. your age there, Porky. Yeah, uh, listen, I know, mate. Listen. I was devastated when that goal went in. But what I will say is that Claude, he's a passionate like me and he must be in his element with the last two wins Arsenal have had, eh? <laughs> I know. He, he's a hardcore Arsenal fan. That's what we need. We need uh, Arsenal fan TV. Everybody that comes on here needs to create a character. I remember yeah. that story somebody told me. This, this, this was all not told me, told the internet. And I watched this story and me and my mates were chatting about it. And it turned out that there were these tickets for this game that were going on sale. At, uh, this was when it were hybrid, you know, years ago. Yes. yes. And a uh, woman said, when we open up in a minute, I know who's going to be first for the tickets. And they all went, oh, and they went, Claude, anyway. They opened up and he was first one there. We, and he had his nose pressed up against glass <laughs> <laughs> for, <clears throat> for his ticket for uh, I, hybrid for Champions League. So people like Claude at Arsenal, an Arsenal fan, I've got time for people like that because 
it's the life in it like boxing's our life in it what we love and it's our passion and Claude at Arsenal, he's proper Arsenal hardcore, isn't he? Yeah, and they also put in the sport, you know. It's whether you come on here or whether you buy tickets for shows, uh, you know, whether you train at a local amateur club or go to a club and fund it. You know, people put in in the sport. I mean, you have too many people on Twitter with opinions that don't put anything into the sport. You know, they don't engage. They only engage with IFL. Yeah. They only watch the shows on match room you know the only thing they're doing is feathering eddie hearn's nest and yeah everybody else but they're not putting anything into the sport yeah he's the guy that goes to you know 38 games a year home and away in league and then you've got you know all the rest of it champions league you know he probably spends about ten thousand pound a year being an arsenal yeah, fan. but you can have an opinion when you're a consumer of something isn't it but when you're putting into something it's like when you go to a restaurant, I can't just go outside a restaurant and rant that the food's not very good. You know, once you pay for it or, you know, you invest your time, then you can say stuff. I think that's really what boxing should be about. There's too many people that just take from the sport and use it to vent their anger, but don't do anything. I mean, we've all earned our stripes in boxing, you and me and Terry and others that come on this channel. Yeah. Oh, tell me about it. We've put us timing, haven't we? And we like to, we invest in the sport, but I think that Martin Theobald made a good comment a, a, a while back and he said that, not this last podcast, he's just done the one before, and he said that he, do, he doesn't invest in boxing as much as what he used to do because of you know, how it's run and things like that. Do you know what I mean? For example, you know the EIS up there, right? Do you know years ago... The, professionals weren't allowed to train with amateurs at Crystal Palace. There would be yeah. hell on. So why has it been allowed to happen up at there at Sheffield? Robert McCracken doesn't do any corner work with any amateurs, but yet he's the head of the, the, the boxing program up there. And he's, he's involved with fighters up there that are training there on a daily basis. We amateurs, these are professionals. So how can that be? And who's allowing that to happen? Is it because of the money involved? And is this why... The government didn't give anything to boxing because none of them can be trusted because it's it's de it's rooted in corruption from the amateur level downwards all the way up to board. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, yeah, I think the government didn't give any money because they don't know where to give it, and also there's no governance of the sport. You can't guarantee that anybody's going to fairly distribute the money. But I think for boxing, in terms of not getting out of it. Last night was an example of a good fight as a good price point. We shouldn't be paying 20 quid for these fights or 25 quid. I think it's all about having good fights. You know, I was speaking to somebody back in Finland that's a big UFC fan, and he was saying that the UFC have really stepped up during this pandemic, and, you know, they've given back to the fans, and the pandemic was a perfect opportunity, or even still, you know, when we all stuck at home in tier whatever, it's a perfect opportunity for boxing to put on some good fights, competitive fights, and, you know, get people reignited with the sport. We can't have, you know, we can't have some of the dross that was on Eddie's back, you know, in, in Eddie's back garden as sort of the best fights that can be made on free-to-air television. Or yeah. free-to-air in Sky, they used to all pay a subscription. Do you feel that uh, Eddie's got some brass neck on him now? Uh, I mean, we Obviously, there's a lot of things I can't go into because it would expose people who've told me. But there's a there's a there's a small whisper doing rounds that Sky Boxing might not be no more, and that uh, they're giving up for it. This is what I'm hearing. I mean, you've already got Adam Smith jumping over to darts, haven't we, to feather his nest there? When is that going to be announced? Do you know? Well, I don't know, but Eddie's deal coming comes to an end soon, doesn't it? So are they going to yeah. get one? I don't know, but is he heavily involved with Dazone? And we've got Luke Campbell, who's been through the Sky Sports system. The Sky have had him from day one, the first 23 fights. On his 24th fight, he's on Dazone, have, have, have got it in, in England. So where does that leave the relationship between Sky and Eddie Hearn and Luke Campbell? Is it fractured now? Or has, is Eddie just a charlatan and he's just a, a, a robber like... Uh, what's that programme now? What's that highway, Robert? Dick Turpin. Is Eddie Dick Turpin? 
I, look, I think Eddie's always done what's best for him and, you know, credit to him. He's a businessman and but Sky have allowed it. I think the big challenge with Sky and their boxing is that people don't sign up to Sky to watch the boxing. And the reason for that is that if you want to watch any decent fight on Sky, you have to pay pay-per-view. People aren't signing up casuals to watch Eggington versus Cheeseman. Not that it's not a good fight, but it's not exactly a subscription driver, is it? No. Like only people like us and people that watch this channel and a small microcosm of Twitter actually care about it. But in general, imagine if you signed up to Sky Football and the only thing you saw was championship and League One games or League One games, even championships too high of a standard. Um, and then anytime you want to watch a Premier League game, you have to pay per view, you know, you have to pay for it. Surely you're just going to pay for whatever you want to watch. You're not going to be paying to watch the lower level stuff. It's all a myth that people are sort of, even if you don't want to believe the Katie Taylor numbers or you don't believe them, which I don't, but it's just a good example by giving people good content for free. It makes a big difference. People can actually get engaged. How can you get engaged in something in the middle of a pandemic where people are struggling um, when every time you want to watch something decent, you're having to shell out 20 or 25 quid. Yeah. All right, then. Moving on, then. Final topic. What fights do you want to see in 2021, Rico? Give me your top five fights. No, five. No. Give me four fights you'd like to see this year. Uh, Tank versus Teofimo Lopez. Yeah. That's top of the list. Uh, I mean, Fury Joshua is a given, but that's not going to happen or it's quite unlikely. I'd like to see Spence against Crawford. Hopefully with the fractious relationship that is Bob Arum and Crawford, they can make that happen somehow with Crawford jumping over to PBC. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd quite like to see... Yeah, I'd like to see uh, Callum Johnson against Boazzi. That's up there for me. I think that would be a great fight. Um, yeah, I would, else... would you like to see Beefy against Eubank? Um, I wouldn't mind that fight, but it's just the weight thing. Eubank's campaign at 168, if they can make it 160, I think that's a good fight, but I don't think it's in my top four. What about uh, Jose Burton against Joshua Boazzi? Yeah, that's a good fight. Want to see that? Um, about Natasha I, Jonas against Terry Harper rematch. That's another very good fight. Can I'd I, like to see Canelo against uh, Charlo at one sixty. What about uh, Billy Joe against Canelo at one sixty? No, I'm not too fast about that one. I don't think Billy Joe presents a huge amount. You know, it's a good fight if Canelo wants to fight at 160. I think it's a good fight, but I'd rather see against Charles. I'd love to see Billy Joe Eubank rematch at 160 or 168. I'd love to see that. What about John Ryder against Callum rematch? Yeah. I think it's, it's a good fight to make now, but again, it's not like super exciting as a fight. I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see Callum fight against. Yeah, I think Callum, there's a lot of potential to make good fights. And now that he's been beat, it might help to make some more fights for him. He might be less, you know, people might be more willing to fight against him. But it depends whether Callum wants to step up uh, weight class. I mean, Callum against Jacob would be an interesting fight or Benavidez. What about Shannon Courtney against Rachel Ball rematch? No, I don't need to see Shannon Courtney on my TV, thank you. What about Josh The reason Wilder? is I don't want to see 15 IFL interviews before and 15 after. What about Josh Whale against somebody in his weight class fighting for a European title? Would you like to see that? Yeah, I think Josh Whale's a good fighter and I think he's coming to that point of his career where time to have that big step up fight against I think maybe Jazza Dickens against Josh Wales he already fought once yeah but you know he's just won the golden contract Josh Wales improved so why not have a rematch yeah that's maybe a good fight that for Josh 
What about uh, Jamie McDonnell and Gavin McDonnell? Are they going to come back or are they washed up? I mean, does anybody care? Eddie don't care, does he? No, does it? I mean, Jamie McDonnell just needs to get on the straight and narrow. And sorry, Gavin McDonnell and no, it's Jamie, isn't it? Jamie needs Jamie to go on straight and. And Gavin McDonald has never been that exciting of a fight to watch. Gavin McDonald's fat as a pig Michelin man. Come on, bird. Or is it Jamie? I always get them mixed up. Uh, yeah, uh, I think if Jamie's the one that's been parting heavily. Is it? Well, yeah, both of them are not fighting, are they? Colwell's dropped them both, didn't he? I mean, Colwell's busy with uh, Jordan Gill on, on Instagram and getting his son into, you know, getting a doing his weekly media round. What do you think uh, about the rumour doing rounds that Caldwell were the one who said to Eddie Earn that I'm wasting my time with them? You think that's true? What's who? You think Caldwell backstabbed McDonald's behind the scenes to Eddie Earn? Uh, probably, yeah. I mean, look, Eddie gets, he probably gets fighters that way. He gave me, Part of the reason of having a house trainer is that they keep you updated about stuff. Mainly if you're not a house trainer, you want your fighters to have the big fights. If Colwell's honest where the Eddie will just give him more fighters and they can snitch on them. Yeah, so Dave Colwell, you little snitch, come see me. So I think that's about it. Now we've just finished slating Dave Colwell, a.k.a. Bertie Smalls. Uh... And we'll move on to the last question. It's not right on my list, but I want to cover it. What next for Dillian White, a.k.a. the body snatcher, a.k.a. the can't man? Anyone who wants it can't get it. What next? He'll probably be running polls against, you know, he'll be running polls who he should fight against next, calling Wilder Coward, and then he'll end up fighting against... Marius, Marius back in a rematch. Life, Something uh, like that. Or Parker, maybe. Parker might be. Gillian next. White versus Parker. Unfinished business. <laughs> you know what? You should fight against... If you if Usyk doesn't get the next fight against Joshua, um, you should fight against Usyk. I think that will be a good fight. All right, then. No problem. Well, Rico, we've had a good one today. As always. Thank you very much. You have a great Sunday. You've got jet lag. No, two hours, it's fine. And it's two, two hours, hours is ahead. all it is, Rico. Yeah, and it's two hours ahead, so it's fine. That's why I was running a bit late. I, I thought I put my alarm clock on, but I didn't, so just tired. I've got an alarm clock here from when I was eight year old at the Muppet Show. Is <laughs> <laughs> it one of those which you hit like this when it's. Uh... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a family heirloom. <laughs> <laughs> so, no problem, man. All right, well, Rico, you have a great day and we'll speak. This yeah. later on in the week. Yeah, Peace speak out. to you soon, mate. Thank Bye -bye. you, everybody. Subscribe. Cheers. Don't forget to subscribe or come see me. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye. Well, uh, that was my uh, good buddy, Rico, from Finland. It's uh, only a stone throw from Denneby. <laughs> now, I'm never good at geography. So that's about it, really. I'll wrap it up. I've got a guy coming on in 20 minutes called, I think his name's Ryan. He's English. He lives in New York. He wants to come on. There's an Australian guy coming on and a Welshman. So all very interesting. So peace out. Keep on trucking and keep sporting boxing. Big, big shout out to Innovation Alloys. South Yorkshire packaging. And we'll get lads on boxing asylum a shout out as well. And Terry's Terry's pod, the beautiful boxing podcast. All right. Peace out.